Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to today's New York State Archives presentation of Managing Case Files. Today's presenters are Maria McCashin and Jennifer O'Neill. The session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box to the right side of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Please do not type your question into the Q&A tab since we are not using this feature. And now I will turn the presentation over to Maria. Thank you, Rich. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Managing case files. Is everyone seeing the screen correctly? Hi, Maria. Yes, I see that you had advanced the slide. And does the image fit in the screen? Yes. What did I do? Oh, I hit the wrong box. Sorry, everyone. Okay, let's just jump right in with uh, today's agenda. Did it again? Okay. <laughs> Today, we will define case files, and we'll look at some examples found in government and different formats used to maintain them. And then we will also discuss their creation and content and look at ways to improve their access, including digital options. And then we'll discuss retention and disposition, and we'll end with the importance of policies and procedures to support a system for managing them. So hopefully none of you are dealing with issues like those in this photo, but you may be familiar with some of these problems listed, uh, problems that can make managing case files challenging, like poor equipment, so filing cabinets with no locks, missing parts, like the parts that prevent slumping, or drawers that are hard to open or close, or you might have files and they might have top, ta top tabs, um, but you might not have a color or other coded system to make accessing the records easy. Or you may not have good organization of the case files at all. You might not have a master list of subject terms for staff creating files to follow, which would enable consistent labeling. Or you might have active files overcrowded with inactive files. You may have really well organized paper records, um, but they're just cumbersome to use and they would benefit from automated retrieval, but you don't have that. Or you may not have policies and procedures to support your system, or you may be dealing with the challenge of managing files that contain records with different retention periods. So the results of poor versus efficient management of case files may be obvious, but here are some comparisons. Some of the biggest risks may be not finding the information you need to do your job or to fulfill public or other information requests or losing critical information due to a poor or no filing system or your time wasted trying to use files that aren't organized. So the goal of this webinar is to help you manage case files more efficiently and reap some of the benefits on the right-hand side of the slide. Records that are filed accurately, quick retrieval, time savings, good public service, and a system that makes your work easier. So what are case files? They're compiled information relating to a specific person or a project or an event, and they contain different kinds of records from many sources that are created or received by the organization. And the records often have different retention periods, including a retention period we call event-based retention. So event-based retention means something has to happen before the records retention period begins. 
So for example, a person leaves the organization or a project ends or a case closes and then a six or other a six year or other retention period begins. Well, these are some examples of case files that you may be familiar with. So relating to individuals on the left-hand side and events or projects on the right-hand side. These are examples of common government case files. Anyone out there managing case files other than those on the slide? If so, feel free to type the ones that you're managing in the, the uh, chat box. All of these include records with event-based retention, and many also include a mix of records with retention periods ranging from zero to permanent. Certain medical, legal, and investigation files can be destroyed completely after fulfilling specific event-based retention periods. Others, like case files relating to certain properties, may not have permanent retention, but may be deemed historically significant and are kept permanently for that reason. Others, like uh, let's see, student files or capital projects, um, they may have records with retention periods that are event-based, permanent, and then shorter retention in between. Case files are usually filed together as one record series. So just like we saw, personnel files, property files, or student files, and each case within the record series is created to support the same activity or function. Like in this example on the slide that came from the state agency general schedule, personal history files are created to support personnel administration. And each file may contain similar types of records, like those that are described on the schedule item. So applications, resumes, appointment letters, et cetera. In this example, most of the records described have a retention period of six years after the employee separates from the agency. However, if there were disciplinary records, those might be kept separate or separated within the file for earlier disposal, because if you look at the minimum retention and disposition, it indicates destroy six years after the employee's separation from the agency, or unless earlier disposition is permitted under terms of a labor management contractual agreement, which relates to disciplinary records. So this is just one example, and we do have more for you. But first, Jennifer is going to talk about some common case file formats. I will pass her. Thank you, Maria. So um, I'm going to uh, review some common case file formats. Um, as you can see on the screen, case files come in a variety of formats. So we're gonna go through each of these and review and evaluate them. Um, so they include paper, um, digital images, electronic files, hosted systems, microfilm, and hybrid systems. Paper files are the most common format, and it's still probably the dominant format used for case files. All of you are probably familiar with paper case files. You probably have them in your office or you've seen them um, in your experience. These are very um, uh, usually user friendly, um, so people feel comfortable using them. They can be used um, during any part of the life cycle, um, including for active or um, inactive of the phase of the life cycle. When you have active records, you're normally receiving them or creating them, storing them in a folder, putting them in a file cabinet, 
after a period of time has passed and the records become inactive, the records may be boxed up and put into your inactive record storage space. These paper records are usually a low cost format. Um, if you have a good filing system, you're regularly purging the records and they're stored under good in environmental controls, they'll usually last a long time. Um, it, paper can last about 100 years um, if it's well maintained. That makes it a really easy format to have to deal with. There are some disadvantages though, and one of them you can probably guess. They're very voluminous and they are the most voluminous format that we'll talk about. You'll also, um, and you've probably unfortunately experienced this, um, paper is easy to remove or lose from the files and to misfile. And this tends to happen because case files usually need to be accessed by multiple people. So files get lost, they get misfiled. Um, it's not a good thing, but sometimes it happens. Another type of case file format are digital case files. And by digital case files, we're talking about scanned images of paper files. Um, now, I know all of you are familiar with our digital imaging guidelines, so you know that you should be storing your case files in basic PDF format if the records have a retention period of less than 10 years, or in PDF slash A format, which is the archival format for long-term or permanent records. The greatest um, advantage to having your records in a digital format is for retrieval purposes. Um, it allows for you to do complex retrievals, like if you need to search on multiple criteria or you need to be able to retrieve the records in a way other than which they might be physically filed. It also allows access by multiple users, which is really helpful. And it was particularly handy during the pandemic that people were able to access case files remotely um, from their home, um, maybe from other um, offices or in the field. It offers enhanced management and security. So, um, for instance, uh, with the example that Maria gave, if you have personnel records that have multiple retention periods, you're able to divide up those files according to the retention periods to make it easier to manage them. Digital case files can be integrated into an EDMS or they might be managed in um, electronic folders like you see on the screen in the image. You, you'll need to do some careful planning and um, in, uh, come up with some strict controls though before you look to um, even scanning quite honestly. Um, so for example, with student records, uh, you might be tempted to scan the entire case file, but if you look at the retention periods, you'll see that some student records might be kept for six years, so those might not be ideal candidates for scanning. Um, we usually recommend that scanning be used for records that have a 10-year retention period and longer. So you may keep your student records in paper format um, for those that have a six-year retention period and those with longer retention periods, you decide you're just going to scan those. You also should look at what your needs and your workflow 
are um, to decide what the best technology would be to use. Um, maybe you have um, a simple process, you have few records, so manag managing your digital case files in a, an electronic folder structure on your LAN may be sufficient. Or if you have a more complicated workflow or a lot of records you're managing, it might be better to use um, an electronic document management system or EDMS. Since you have a number of people who will be accessing these records, you need to establish some controls. So those could include um, naming conventions for naming your files. Um, they could include um, using certain terminology to um, describe um, and index your records um, within the EDMS. Um, so you really need to really carefully think things through um, when you're dealing with digital case files. Next, we're gonna look at electronic case files. Um, these are different than the digital case files that we just talked about because um, by electronic, we're talking about born digital files. So these are files that were created by an application software. Um, maybe you, um, received a fillable PDF from a customer, or you created a record using your word processing software, or uh, you have a spreadsheet or database file. Um, so these are the types of records that we're um, talking about. Obviously, if they're created originally in digital format, you don't need to scan these records and incur costs for scanning them. However, we have run across, and, and I have an example from a few years ago where I was dealing with an agency who had emails. Um, they were printing out the emails and then they were adding them to their document, scanning them and adding them to their document management system. Um, Ideally, they, their document management system would be able to interact with their email system so that they could bypass needing to print out the records and scan them and just add them directly to their EDMS system. Often the case files um, are integrated into an electronic document management system, or they may be part of some sort of system that might cater specifically to a certain uh, function, uh, let's say. So many school districts are using student information systems and those systems allow them to manage general student data, things like grades, classes that are being taken, and attendance. And also they can um, manage special education case files. Another area where we see some specialization in um, systems are for legal case files. Um, these can be um, uh, complicated to manage. If you have non-proprietary um, formats that you want to introduce into the system, um, your system might not be able to open them or they might not be functional within your system for a long term, so you'll need to convert the file. Keep in mind that these electronic case files um, or the electronic files are not gonna be a solution for every situation. You may still have customers who are submitting records to you in paper format. 
So you're going to need to either rekey that paper or you will need to scan it um, and add it into your electronic case files. You may also run across things like handwritten comments or post-it notes or signatures or seals on building plans where you may decide that you don't want those in electronic format or you need to somehow integrate them um, uh, with your case files. Maybe you leave them in paper format and then have a cross-reference to your electronic case files. Another type of format are online hosted web-based case files. And these are ones that are hosted by external entities. Um, it could be the county, it could be the state, or it could be uh, the federal government. These are often sophisticated online databases that allow um, you as a local government or a state agency to submit and access your case files. So let's look at a, a few examples. Um, the Unified Court System manages what they call the New York State Court Electronic Filing. Um, and this is a system um, that manages court cases. It is electronic filing is authorized in certain courts and for certain case types. So if you're interested in more information, you can go take a look at the Unified Court Systems website. Um, another example is the uh, New York State Office of Real Property Tax Services real property system and this system's been around um, quite a while it's on version 4 i believe um, and this is often used by counties um, and the state um, for tax assessment purposes um, social services is another example um, the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance and the Office of Children and Family Services. Um, they are involved in managing uh, what's called My Benefits system. And that includes applications like for SNAP, um, for public assistance, uh, for reimbursement of daycare expenses, um, and all of those um, uh, applications are managed within there for counties to, um, to access, as well as customers. In the criminal justice area, um, the federal government um, has a number of systems. Some of these are national um, that um, are available for state and local polices to use. Um, they have a fingerprint identification system and an incident-based um, reporting system as well. And then there are um, GIS and mapping applications. Um, generally, uh, we see a lot of counties who are uh, coordinating and hosting GIS applications for um, municipalities. The next type of uh, case file is um, for microfilm. And uh, this is still used. We still recommend its use. Um, one of the main advantages is that it frees up a lot of space that might be taken up by paper records. Um, it is commonly used to reformat inactive records, um, particularly long-term and permanent records. It has the ability to um, uh, combine various sizes of records. Um, so often you'll see architectural drawings, which tend to be oversized 
um, stored on the same roll of film as um, uh, specs or manuals um, that are normal office paper size. Microfilm also helps to maintain the integrity and security of records. So it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get information on a roll of film out of order. And another handy feature is that storing master microfilm offsite is a great um, backup um, procedure to put in place. It, microfilm's also an ideal preservation tool. You really don't have to do much other than provide good environmental conditions for it, and it can last up to 500 years. Um, it is analog and eye-readable, though um, it's, it's easier to view if you have some sort of microfilm viewer. Some of the disadvantages are um, that access. Because you need a microfilm viewer, um, you might not have one in your government and might have to go to the local library to, in order to view the records. Um, you might be able to improve access by using a database and uh, using that database to index and provide the location of the file on the film um, by matching it with a blip on the, on the film itself. One disadvantage um, in terms of access that I've seen with state agency records is um, uh, one agency um, has uh, regularly been transferring its permanent records to the state archives. Periodically, they will cut off their files, put them on microfilm, um, and they will have multiple record series on one roll of film. Each series might have different um, confidentiality um, and access restrictions associated with it, so it makes it very difficult for us to uh, make the records available to researchers um, because we have to go through and make sure there aren't restrictions for each record uh, within each series. Just something to keep in mind. And then finally, you can use um, a hybrid approach um, to your case files. So you might be able to uh, use paper and microfilm, or paper and electronic, or microfilm and electronic, or all three. Um, you should consider using different media for different purposes. So using social service case files as an example, you may use paper files for the most recent records that you have but maybe for your older records, you scan those so you can have good access to them. And then for your permanent social services records, you might microfilm them so that they are well preserved. Um, you may decide to keep the records in a certain format because it's easier to just manage them in that format uh, rather than convert them. Maybe they have a short ret retention period. And some people choose to um, have different formats um, for their case files because it provides built-in redundancy. Um, so particularly if you have a significant set of records, um, it, it provides that additional um, backup and duplication that um, is, is helpful. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll get started while you pass me the, the baton. There you go. 
<laughs> Thank you. So in this part of the webinar, we'll look at strategies for managing case files and their content at creation and through the life cycle of the file. We'll look at some ways to improve access, including digital options, which Jennifer talked a lot about, but we'll touch on that more. We'll address confidentiality and security needs, physical management of paper files, and retention and disposition, including some more strategies for addressing mixed and event-based retention. So the management of case files can change during their life cycle due to mixed and event-based retention. And addressing certain issues early in the life cycle can improve case file management. So for example, once you determine when a case file should be opened or when a case file is opened, at that point would be a good time to decide and document things like how the files will be labeled and what records are anticipated in the files and the retention of those records and any needs for security and access restrictions. You also would wanna determine where the records will reside. So if all records will be in one file, one location in one format, or if you're going to set up a type of hybrid system like Jennifer discussed. You also wanna determine what must occur when the case file closes. So when it closes, what needs to happen before it closes? And at that point, you would also wanna write procedures for things like when the records will, re whether or not the records will remain in the same storage location, or if they're going to be transferred to another location when the case file closes or the records become inactive. It can also be helpful to write procedures for managing the files when they're inactive and at their final disposition. So anticipating the types of records contained in the file can help separate the records by retention periods and can be one way to make records disposition easier once the case files become inactive or are closed. So for most types of case files, all records in the file are not permanent. One management strategy is to use two retention periods for the records in the file. So the longest retention period of all the records in the file that's not permanent and permanent retention. And when the first retention period is up, destroy the records covered by that retention period and then refile the remaining records with permanent retention. It can also be helpful for management to anticipate large formats like plans in building case files and decide how you intend to manage those. So for example, a government may require that all large format records are received and maintained in electronic format, regardless of the format of the rest of the file. And if this results in a hybrid filing system, you wanna be sure to label both formats with the same terms so that they can be identified as a part of the same case file. The image on this slide is a business process map and it comes from the Digital Towpath Cooperative's Electronic Records Management System Toolkit, which is available for free. We also have a link to it at the end of this webinar. And it maps the relationships between units and functions related to building and property regulation. And it's intended to plan for managing a subdivision case file in an electronic records management system. However, the same process could be used to identify and map the flow of records of any function of government that creates case files. The files that you see in the center of the image belong to the planning unit, and the map shows their position in the process for approving subdivisions. Um, it includes information um, related to when the case file is opened, how it's named, key records that it contains, and the ownership of the file. So it's prepared to man it's prepared in order to plan to manage digital files, but the same information could be used to manage paper files. If you're working with paper files or a hybrid system that involves paper, setting up or purchasing a system to track files is one way to improve access and retrieval. 
So if you have a tracking system, it's going to give you greater control over the files because it will enable you to track more information about the files. It'll enable you to document and make decisions about the files, like designating a file inactive and assigning disposition to either the entire case file or to specific records in the file. Multiple data fields will enable you to provide multiple access and retrieval points. And a system may allow for automated retrieval, like barcoding. On the right hand side of the slide are some examples of fields that would be helpful to use for tracking, including the case file title, so a person's name or project title, a case file number, dates, such as when the case is opened, when it's closed, and that can be useful for tracking the age of the file and retention of cases. The location of active files or inactive files in storage, or if there are any files on microfilm or in a digital system. The date of disposition, so the database can give you a list of all the files to dispose of on a certain date. File status, like open versus closed or active versus inactive and information about the case file manager. So either a person or a position that's in charge of the case file. And if you are a local government, local government records management improvement fund grants could be used to purchase and implement a tracking system like this. So we mentioned poor filing equipment. So it can make using case files difficult and labor intensive, even if they are organized. So changing your equipment can have a big impact. And it can also enable you to implement a better organization for your files if that's what you would like to do or need to do. This file shows equipment for active paper files, and it's designed to reduce the amount of storage space used in an office. So you can see in this image, the files are stored on two sided shelving units that go all the way to the ceiling. So this is going to allow you to store many more files in the same footprint as you would be able to with a standard filing cabinet. It also stores the files in a manner that makes them more accessible. Because you can see more files and you can see more of their labels. It supports the use of file folders that can be labeled using a coding filing system that could involve colors, numbers, letters, or a combination of those. And if you are a local government, LGRMIF grants could be used to not only purchase the equipment, but implement a new organization if that's what you needed to do. We talked, or Jennifer talked about digitizing case files. So that's another way to manage the files. Um, to change their format to digital and manage them in a document or a content management system. So the entire series of paper case files, both active and inactive, could be scanned and managed in a system or a hybrid system could be set up. So for example, case files might be maintained on paper until they're inactive and until event-based retention requirements have been met for certain records. And then once those records are purged, any remaining long-term or permanent records could be scanned and maintained digitally. Now Jennifer mentioned planning, and it would require planning and setting up a digital system for management. It also could involve a project to address existing files, and that would involve inventorying the records, organizing them, preparing the paper files for scanning, and then scanning and indexing them. And to index them, you would want to um, be thoughtful about the index terms that you select. And then managing the images and the indexing in a new system and creating day forward procedures in order to maintain the case files in a digital format and maintain the system. In addition, a system for long term records would need to have remote backups a migration plan, and a commitment by the organization to maintain the new format and the system. If you happen to be a local government, you can use LGRMIF grant funds 
to uh, do a digitization project and or to implement, implement a document management system. And as Jennifer mentioned, whether or not you apply for grants or whether or not you are a local government or a state agency, you want to ensure or be sure to be following the digital imaging guidelines for creation of digital images. And if you need more information about how to manage a project like this, we have guidance in our Managing Imaging Projects publication. And they're both available on the State Archives website. Managing case files requires knowing and understanding any related privacy laws. So some examples, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, or the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA, or the Personal Privacy Protection Law. And then there may be other laws. And if you're not sure about providing access to certain records, you can contact the Committee on Open Government for advice or opinions. Confidentiality and security needs should be addressed and implemented at creation and maintained whether the files are active or inactive. And if only certain records in the file are confidential, something you might do is maintain a list of those records and include it in any procedures that you create. Case files on individuals often contain confidential information, but it may be only a portion of the files. So some records or parts of the records are public and then other parts are not. So your procedures should ensure that private information is not released and it should include steps for things like redaction and also how to release information either to the public or the individual that the case file pertains to or in the event of a legal request. Also, you want to ensure that you have levels of authorized access for records that are stored in electronic systems and that you have physical security installed for paper files. Speaking of paper files, these are some recommendations to help improve managing paper files. So like we said, they take up a lot of storage space. And we looked at a space saving system for files in an office, but for inactive storage, the most cost effective and efficient storage is open metal shelves and boxes as shown in the photo. These store more files per square foot than standard filing cabinets because you can store the records twice as high. Also weeding files on a schedule can help. Removing unnecessary records will reduce the bulk of the files. And this could occur at certain points in the life cycle, for example, when a case file is moved to inactive storage or after event-based retention has been met. And to make this easy, document what records can be removed in your procedures. Also, discarding duplicate records can reduce bulk and it will prevent any confusion about which is the official record copy. You may have a filing system for files in your office, but you may need to set up a new filing system for the boxes of inactive files while still remaining uh, maintaining the filing system that was implemented in your office. And your filing system should enable access and incorporate retention and disposition. So an example on this slide shows color coding on boxes of court cases. So the color indicates types of cases and closed cases are filed within the boxes by case number. So a system on the outside of the box, a system on the inside of the box. Attached to the shelves, you can see a white piece of paper that is the key to the color coding, and it has box and location, box location and content information in it. Also, the individual files within the boxes, when they were active, they were color coded by type of case. Um, so blue, green, pink, purple. And this was done by a low cost method of simply highlighting the file tab with um, a marker. 
and then the court clerk regularly moves the inactive files out of the office on a regular schedule so that their office their office is not overwhelmed by records that they're not using and as we discussed on the previous slide another option for managing paper files that you might consider would be reformatting the records so if they're not frequently accessed you might want to consider microfilm or if they are frequently accessed you might want to scan the inactive records or you may want to start if if you have an opportunity to um, eliminate paper altogether and convert to an electronic system or incorporate a hybrid system which jennifer mentioned setting up a system like this purchasing the equipment or services to implement the new organization if you are a local government this could be funded with LGRMIF LGR grant funds. Now, this is a, a personnel files file example that relates to local government personnel files. So they can have a combination of records and retentions that include six years after the person leaves the organization, permanent, and then records with shorter retention somewhere in between that. So one way to make their management easier is to group records by the two longest retention periods and dispose of the records twice. So after the individual leaves the organization, you want to remove the file out of active storage into inactive storage and assign retention of six years after the individual leaves the organization in order to purge the records and then refile the remaining records that have permanent retention in another system marked permanent. Creating a case file retention sheet, like the one shown on the slide, this can help with managing the records. So in this example, it lists anticipated records that are anticipated in the personnel file. So you would want to make it specific to your personnel case files. It also includes the retention schedule item that matches that record and the retention period. So documenting these details can help ensure that the correct records are maintained in the file. Can also indicate what records can be disposed of six years after the person leaves the organization and whether any records must be kept forever. The retention sheet could also be expanded to include information on restrictions, related formats, and procedures for managing, which might involve some of these considerations, including separating permanent from non-permanent records at creation, or filing everything together and purging at the specified times, like I mentioned, or retaining non-permanent records on paper and scanning all of the permanent records. This example includes an excerpt from the local government schedule with retention periods for police investigation files based on type of case. So you can see the retention schedule item is 1222, and there are various types of offenses A through G. So for example, homicides, suicides, missing persons, and other serious felonies have a permanent retention. Other felonies have a 25 year retention and still other felonies have a 10 year retention and then misdemeanors have a five year retention followed by other short offenses. So considerations for managing these files might include separating the records by offense at creation or using that low cost system of marking the top tab file with a color related to a specific offense. Um, and that can be helpful if you're fi filing all of the offenses by case file number. You could also digitize the records at creation or when the long term or permanent case file records are closed. Paper files, once closed, could be stored in boxes under color coded in a color coded system by type of case, which would help track retention and disposition. And that would be similar to the one that we just looked at with court cases. 
So now I'm going to transfer the baton back to Jennifer and she's going to provide you with some more samples and take you to the end of the webinar. Great, thanks Maria. I'm going to share with you a couple of state agency examples that might be applicable to a local government environment also. Um, so we are currently working with the um, New York State uh, Mental Office of Mental Health and the Office of Developmental Disabilities. Um, uh, and we, this is just a general, generalized uh, retention schedule that I've presented here on the slide. Uh, permanent records are those that will eventually be transferred to the state archives. And as you can imagine, these records are voluminous. So we can't take everything in, not everything can be considered permanent. Um, so we have to be selective. And this is the selective approach that we've um, decided on. So basically early records before 1920 um, are permanent. Um, any clinical case files that were already microfilmed, we have um, only, only the core records, like the admission and discharge records and some of the other medical records um, we would consider permanent. We have to further refine um, a sampling plan to further um, reduce the number of records that are permanent. And if a patient died in state care, uh, we're considering that permanent. If a patient is uh, discharged, uh, we have a pretty detailed listing of routine administrative and fiscal records that have a short retention period after which they can be destroyed. Um, for otherwise for discharged patients, we have another um, retention period uh, where the less routine um, records need to be kept for a fairly long period of time um, after the date of birth, um, which is assuming that the person will be deceased at that point. So we really encourage these agencies to separate the records um, at the point of creation. So they're separating the permanent records from those that aren't permanent. And then when the when a discharge or death occurs, uh, that's another point in time in which they can separate or should separate the records. Um, it's a good idea to routinely dispose of routine records. And one regional office, office has a really simple but effective way of, of doing this. Uh, they have facilities use different colored paper for different types of documents. And this makes it very easy to identify the, the different uh, documents and when they need to be disposed of. And they actually have patients who are doing this purging function for them because it's such a simple, simple system. Uh, they certainly can digitize records at, at any time. Um, they are using and starting to use an electronic health record, so it may be helpful to have files uh, digitized and maintained alongside those electronic records. And then facilities should regularly send inactive records to um, centralized uh, record storage areas, and they have a variety uh, uh, to choose from. And I should mention that these, both these agencies have their clinical case files in all of the file formats that we talked about. Um, another example and is uh, for legal litigation files and these files for both state agencies and local governments um, have retentions of either permanent 
and there are some criteria listed there um, to consider for you to decide whether or not they are permanent. Um, and then there will be certain litigation files that can be destroyed um, after six or 10 years uh, after the case is closed or the minor attains age uh, 21. We really strongly consider that you separate cases before moving to an inactive storage area. We've been dealing with one agency who did not do this. And so now they are struggling to find someone who's familiar enough with the cases and can apply the archival criteria to those cases to determine whether they are permanent or whether they can be destroyed. It's much easier to do it if you have people who are familiar with these cases, do it at that time before they even get moved out of the office. Um, these case files normally are bulky. A lot of it's because of duplicates um, for reference purposes and otherwise important to purge them. Um, Oftentimes you'll see indexes created to allow for efficient retrieval of records. Uh, you could just have index cards as a simple way or a spreadsheet. More complicated means would be through a database or a case management software. Um, sometimes these are organized by issue or subject matter, but in other cases it makes more sense to file by defendant name. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. We've talked um, a lot about all of these things already. Basically, we strongly encourage you to document your policies and procedures uh, for managing your case files. And there's certainly a number of benefits for doing this. Uh, we've talked about these. Um, uh, we do encourage that you use a file manual and we certainly you can Google and I did this the other day. You can find lots of good examples of file manuals that people are using. Um, these are great uh, file manuals are great as training tools for new staff that come in. Um, they also provide you with good defense should you have to testify in court uh, for your procedures and they demonstrate that you were not negligent. Um, all of the things that Maria mentioned when she was talking um, about the life cycle of case files, you should document. Um, that way everyone will be on the same page. In your handout that you receive by email, there are some really excellent case file manual examples. Um, there's a real life one by Clarkstown Central School District for management of their case files. Um, they go into a lot of detail about uh, managing each type of record, um, including uh, handling confidentiality. Then there is one that's loosely based on a state agency, um, the fictitious developmental development corporation. Um, and that's another um, good one that talks um, about uh, each type of record and how to manage it. There's a file survey form for uh, doing an assessment of your paper active records. And there's also a master list of filing terms. This master list of filing terms you can also find on our website under the records indexing list of terms. We also have our local government and state agency general schedules, our retention schedules available on our website. And um, as um, Maria alluded to, the Digital Towpaths Cooperatives ERMS 
toolkit is available. Um, their URL is listed there. So I see that we have gotten a few questions. So um, Rich, could you let us know uh, what those questions are? Sure, Jennifer. I uh, had a question here from Maria. Uh, not our Maria, another Maria. Uh, should fillable document, once submitted, be set with uh, a LGS-1 or just put into a document system with no LGS-1? So I'm um, not real clear. Maybe you can kind of, I can perhaps copy this. Uh, I I think what she's trying to, or what she's saying, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, is so she's uh, receiving a form, they're data entering it. Um, if they're data entering all of the information into their system, then essentially that form may um, it be uh, essentially a duplicate form and can be destroyed after they've data entered and made sure that you know they've not made any uh, errors. Um, so it can be disposed of as a duplicate or there's an item in the um, um, IT section that allows for um, destruction after um, data entry. Okay, I uh, also have a question here from Jake. Is an official resolution necessary if an RMO is looking into digitizing all paper records and making all future digital records as the official copy of the record? I could respond to that. Uh, no, it's not a legal requirement, but it would be an excellent practice in order to um, support the importance of the organization committing to that new system of managing the records. Okay. Um, and we do have a we do mm -hmm. have a sample too. If um, you're interested, you can ask your records advisor, and they can send you a copy. Okay, Daniel. Uh, asked are people still microfilming documents when would this be more useful than digitization i could address that too um we did uh, just uh, maybe recent fairly recently we had um a boces digitize the remaining records of the remaining personnel files um but so they did well you have to digitize them now in order to create the microfilm um, but they, the result of the project, um, the end result was microfilm. So they're retaining the individual case files um, on microfilm. Actually, the microfilm is the backup and the access copy is the microfiche. And when Jennifer was talking about microfilm, there was a desktop um, microfilm, microfiche reader, and a laptop sitting next to it. And that was actually um, an, an image from that BOCES and they're using a um, microfilm microfiche reader to access the personnel files when they are needed. They aren't accessed very often. So that's one of the reasons they went with microfilm, low cost way to manage those records that need to be retained permanently but aren't accessed that often. But that particular desktop um, piece of equipment enabled them to make a digital copy from the microfilm. Um, if someone requested the record, then they could um, use the record in a digital format. Okay, Maria, and speaking of microforms, uh, Paula Fish, our own staff member here, just uh, added a comment. She said, store microforms with care. If stored off-site, don't forget about it. Good point. And uh, a question here from Michelle. Where can I find your sample list of the personnel records? Oh, uh, you could just ask your records advisor and they, they can provide you with a copy. Okay, and we have a question um, from BN. Is there a simple list of retention for personnel records for uh, former employees? Is there a sample list of retention for personnel records for former employees? 
Well, um, one of the the um, reasons I presented the case file example was to actually create that case file uh, case file retention sheet based on records that exist in your own um, organization's personnel files. So you would want to create it. I mean, it's going to be more useful if it incorporates records that are found in your own files. Um, but we do have some samples. And like I mentioned, if you contact your records advisor, they can provide you with some examples. So that might be might be a good starting point. Okay. We also don't forget the LGS one has a personnel civil service section that lists those types of records. And Tara asked, uh, what was the retention period cutoff for PDF versus PDF A? Yeah, so I'm looking at page 8 of the digital imaging guidelines and it is a 10 year cutoff. So records with retention periods of less than 10 years um, can use. Well, they can use BDFA, but um, they can also use basic PDF. Okay, and uh, Jake asks uh, here. Are there any examples for where a paper copy of a record needs to be kept as a permanent record and cannot be digitized as the permanent record? I can answer that one. Um, so for state agencies um, and for local governments, there may be records that have intrinsic value. So they might have signatures or seals or otherwise might have value that makes keeping the paper records um, important. Um, so you wouldn't want to, I mean, you could reformat for access purposes, but you would want to keep the paper version. There are also, I believe, some um, exceptions to for filing uh, or for use of electronic signatures. And I think they have to, deal with um like real property transactions if if i'm ho hopefully that's uh correct um but you might want to check out um the uh, electronic signatures and records act to see what the exceptions are for using electronic signatures um because that might um, be an area where you would need like a, a, a paper original with an ink signature. Okay, and we have a question here uh, from Maria. So departments sending records into storage should be keeping a list of case files as well as a copy of paperwork pertaining to these box files, such as transfers, retrievals, and destruction. Is this correct? I think I can answer that. I mean, that would be good practice. Um, if departments are sending case files just for storage, um, they're in storage because they haven't met their minimum retention requirements, so they still may need to be accessed. So a good practice would be to maintain a list of those case files um, associated with the individual boxes that they're contained in so that they can easily access the records. Um, and um, it can be um, how you manage the records after that could be um, a system that you put in place unique to your organization. So you could have individual departments maintain transfer lists, uh, retrieval information, and uh, destruction authorization are in, lists of records that have been disposed of individually in departments or a good practice would be to have those maintained in one location and often we recommend that the records management officer retains that information but there's no requirement as to how to do it so you know, you, know, you may want to consider how it works best within your own organization i don't see any other questions and i also did put in here uh if we're about 10 minutes past uh the time. Uh, if folks have additional questions, I've posted in uh, where to go to contact uh, our staff if you are from a state agency, New York State Agency, 
or if you are from a local government to contact your New York State Archives Records Advisory Officer. And that's organized by type of government. So the links are there. You can also always go to our website. And of course, you can always email us here at RECMGMT at NYSED.gov. So any uh, final uh, comments, Maria or Jennifer? Thank you everyone for coming. Yes, thank you. And feel free to contract, contact us if you need assistance with your case files. Thanks everybody.